G'day. It's good to see so many of you have still stuck around for the last couple of sessions of the day. Um, I'm Sam. I'm the CTO at Custom D, and uh, we're a custom development shop. We um, are custom development consultants. We do a lot of fintech work, and over the years, we've kind of built up a lot of experience doing, uh, you know, with privacy, regulations, security, and that sort of thing, and particularly encryption. This is my family. Um, I'm based in Christchurch in New Zealand. Uh, and this is in central Otago with the beautiful Southern Alps in the background. Um, and I've got a confession. Um, you know, I know this is a burning question for you all. Um, I'm in the Marmite camp. <laughs> but not this one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> And this is my doggo. This is Pepper. Um, I was actually going to ask Michael, you know, are furry friends required for a speaking position? So you know, maybe next year, if anybody uh, actually wants to apply, you know, maybe you should uh, get a dog from Patima, perhaps. So what are we here to do today? Uh, I'm here to talk about encryption and privacy and security. Um, in New Zealand and Australia, um, we both have very pr similar privacy rules. So we have, um, you know, 13 key privacy principles. And, you know, most countries uh, now have very similar rules with a few differences. But summarising for today, the kind of key important ones um, are that we must have a legitimate reason for storing people's PII, personally identifiable information. And if we do, we must, you know, it's our responsibility to keep that information safe and secure. And so, you know, that is a, you know, legislative requirement. But it's not just that. We also have a social responsibility to keep our users safe. And we don't know what data is going to be dangerous for a user. So it's our responsibility to keep as much information safe as we can. The best approach to this is to, you know, take a defense in depth strategy. So, you know, that's basically putting security at every level of your organization, not just, you know, you know your infrastructure, not just your applications, but also policy, you know, um, physical access to things, all that sort of stuff. Um, and Encryption is a critical part of that strategy. You know, it, it acts at the deepest level, at that data level, um, and it's kind of your last line of defense for users' data. So <clears throat> the goal here, you know, is to make sure that users can only decrypt or only access information that they are supposed to access. So avoiding unauthorized access, right? And you might use, um, say, a cloud provider and host your database there, and you can enable full disk encryption, and that's great. You should be able to, you should do that. Now, that's useful if somebody walks into a data center and steals the hard drive. You know, they can take that away and they won't be able to access your information. That's useful for data center staff. If, uh, you know, someone turns rogue and takes your information, extremely unlikely because they have other policies and protections in place for that. But um, it's not useful if you end up with a live, if somebody unauthorized with a live connection to your database, right? Um, and that's where that deeper level of encryption comes in. And you know, even if an attacker breaks all those other layers, you want to mitigate the effects of such an attack. You want to narrow the scope of the data that your users can, uh, that an unauthorized user can take. So, before we get too much into the weeds, um, I find that a lot of developers who are not used to or haven't worked with encryption a lot get a little bit confused between. Uh, encryption and hashing. Um, I'm just going to quickly level the playing field, make sure that everybody has the same understanding here. Um, at its most basic level, encryption is, you know, you take plain text, you run it through a mathematical algorithm or a cipher, and generate some cipher text, right? And then you can reverse it. If you've got the particular key, you can decrypt that cipher text back into plain text. 
Hashing, on the other hand, is one way. So you can take plain text and create a hash, but you can't reverse that. That's mathematically impossible. So in Laravel, hopefully you'll know about the hash library. You should use that for your passwords. Um, all your boilerplates will come with that, and you know, all of the kind of standard packages will have that built in. That's really nice and easy. Um, and obviously, you know, you can just import the hash facade and make a hash. Yeah. Then you can use the check method to check that any user um, data has uh, exactly matched what you hashed. And that's great because what you're storing is unreadable by you, it's unreadable by anybody. Um, so you're storing that in the database and nobody knows those secrets. We've also got um, the encryption library. So if you're storing PII or commercially sensitive info, you'll probably have used this. And this is, again, really simple, really easy. You just import the crypt facade and run encrypt string to encrypt a string and decrypt string to decrypt the string. Super easy. Great, job done. We're winning. You can go home, sit back, relax, and be really sure that your data is safe, right? But how secure is that really? Can, can an attacker or somebody in your organization that shouldn't have access still get access to that data? Does this shore up our, our defense in depth strategy, right? Well, in a nutshell, yes, the encryption is super secure. It's um, under the hood, it's AES 256 or um, 128. And there's so many unique possible combinations that even with today's supercomputers, it would take until the sun, you know, until the earth runs into the sun just about to, <laughs> uh, to be able to crack one of those codes. So yeah, unbreakable. But what's the problem? Why am I talking to you about this? Um, well, there's two problems, really. Um, first, this doesn't achieve our goal of defense in depth, right? We said that we want to ensure users can only decrypt the information that they should have access to. So the second issue is that, you know, key storage. Can we guarantee that that key is safe? It's sitting on your server somewhere. Um, your employees will have access to it. Your, uh, you know, sysadmin might have access to it. And, you know, you, you just have to um, make sure, you have to know and be aware of the risks with that. So kind of, you know, following a security best practice, um, uh, kind of best advice, the mantra is, uh, you know, you will be hacked. If you have valuable information, you will be hacked at some point, whether you know it or not. If you're uncomfortable with that fact, then you need to mitigate. So, you know, we have that same concern with passwords, and that's why we hash passwords. So, you know, we assume um, that somebody will read the database who shouldn't have access to that password, and so we hash it in a secure way to store it. Now, we have to take this approach. We really have no choice, because the systems we run, the servers, Everything is so complex and we have so little control over all of the individual components that it's impossible for any one person to prevent a data breach. For example, you know, a composer package might be compromised or your server software might be out of date or have security vulnerabilities. Even a fully um, patched OS may have an undisclosed vulnerability. And these are just some of the CVEs that PHP alone has had in the last three years. So even if your um, systems are fully up to date, you patch them every day, at some point they will be vulnerable. So even putting that aside, right, let's say you've jumped through all of those hoops, uh, sorry, let's say an attacker has jumped through all of those hoops, you know, in our security in depth strategy and they've managed to get access to your server, okay? Um, they may have compromised a development machine or uh, exploited a vulnerability in a human, perhaps. Um, they, let's, let's just assume, for now, that they can 
read your app key, and they can access your database. You don't even need to run your app. Um, they, they don't even need to run your app. They don't need to have your source code. They can download the Illuminate encryption library, uh, set up your app key, and they've got access to all of your encrypted data straight away. And they'll have access to all of your encrypted data until you change that app key. Now, depending on the kind of information you're storing and the volume, um, you, there could be some fairly serious consequences for that. You know, um, so how can we limit that? How can we reduce that um, and, and you know, get rid of the worst or you know, reduce the scope of what, what gets leaked and potentially avoid this, poor doggo? Um, in crypto cryptography, there are two distinct kinds of uh, encryption. One we're going to talk about today is symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. So symmetric encryption is what Laravel's crypt library uses. Um, it uses the same key to encrypt as it does to decrypt data. And it's fast and secure, and you know you can uh, encrypt and decrypt unlimited message sizes. It's nice and easy, it's good. Asymmetric encryption, on the other hand, is quite different. So it uses public and private key pairs. Um, it uses a pair of keys, the public key to encrypt and the private key to decrypt. So the public key is not sensitive. You know, you can transmit that in the clear, you can send it out anywhere, anyone can have that and it doesn't matter because it can only encrypt data or verify that data came from the private key. So let's, uh, let's say that um, Sid and Nancy here um, are running on a secure private messaging platform. Uh, Sid here wants to submit a message to Nancy. So he grabs, or so he submits a message to the server and the server grabs Nancy's public key, encrypts the message to her, sends it to her, she decrypts it with her private key, and she can read the message. Now, the benefits of this approach is that Nancy can be sure that obviously the message wasn't edited in transit, um, and it wasn't read by someone in transit. And her private key is kept safe because it never leaves her machine, and you know it can be encrypted locally on her machine as well with say a session token or with a um, password. And we can, of course, we can store the password with a one-way hash in our database. Uh, so we can verify her password and then use a key derived from that to encrypt her private key. And this could potentially solve our problem. This ensures that only Nancy can decrypt the message sent by Sid. But there are, are a couple of drawbacks with asymmetric encryption. First, it's much slower. Um, and the second one, which is a big one, is that you can only encrypt a certain length of data, and that length is smaller than whatever key size you use. And that kind of rules it out for a lot of uses. Um, you might just think, okay, yep, we can just chunk that data up and then encrypt it in bits and then glue it all back together at the end. Um, but that will end up resulting in performance issues because it's asymmetric encryption is slow. And it also reduces the effectiveness of the encryption. Fortunately, there's a lot of smart people in the world and they've put together, uh, they've dreamed up this wonderful idea of combining those two types of encryption into a hybrid encryption um, which makes the best of both asymmetric techniques and um, symmetric techniques in order to overcome message length and performance issues. So basically, you generate a random symmetric key, encrypt your data with that, then you generate, um, then you encrypt that symmetric key with the user's public key, transmit the message, and at the other end, decrypt the private key, then uh, decrypt, sorry, the, the private key will decrypt the symmetric key, and then the symmetric key will decrypt the message, and <laughs> you get the idea. <laughs> so this isn't a novel approach. This is, you, you use this every day, um, whether you realize it or not. This is how TLS works. 
Um, when you make a connection from your client, be it a browser or a terminal, um, that, uh, that client will generate a session key, which is just a symmetric encryption key, right? It will use the server's SSL public key to encrypt that symmetric key. It will transmit, uh, the, the symmetric key will be used to uh, encrypt the request body, and that will be transmitted all in a package to the server. Once it gets to the server, it will then use its SSL private key to decrypt the session key, and the session key will be used to decrypt the, the request body. So, <laughs> Right now, you're probably thinking, I'm lying. I called this, let's make encryption easy, right? <laughs> well, yeah, you're kind of right. Um, maintaining all that logic, you know, um, managing key stores, mapping to the right users, and all those layers of encrypting and decrypting can get really confusing and really difficult to manage. Um, it's definitely not easy. And you know, as, as we've kind of discovered, it's, it's only uh, as effective as your ability to securely store your private keys. Um, <clears throat> so to make it easy, we built a library, as you do, um, called Eloquent Model Encrypt. And it takes care of all the hard bits of this process. And we've um, battle tested this for over five years in production systems uh, for our clients. And today, we're open sourcing it for the Laravel community. So this um, package is designed to be flexible and extensible. Um, it includes an underlying encryption engine, um, but that can be swapped out to whatever you need or desire. Uh, that encryption engine is based on uh, Illuminate encryption encryptor class. Uh, so we're not rolling our own encryption either. We're primarily just handing that secure key storage and access mapping to uh, users versus models. So you can install it with this. And of course, you know, your next steps would be set up. Once you're installed, you do all the usual, usual stuff. You'll uh, publish the uh, config and migration uh, for the key stores. And then finally, we'll generate a um, global public-private key pair. And that's mostly for testing purposes, and it's not really intended for production use. Um, this package is kind of built around a key provider's concept. So a model is assigned one or more key providers. And the key providers are responsible for mapping access to a specific record to a specific user, right? And the logic of how this is achieved is entirely up to you. Um, but we provide kind of three out of the box options. So the first option is the global key provider. And that's what I said before, you know, there's no real security benefit. It's just for trying and for testing stuff out to get you up and running quickly. Um, the user key provider is for mapping individual user records to individual models. So this is used when you want the creator of a record, for example, to be able to access it. Uh, we know that individual keys for individual users, uh, for individual models, is not really going to scale very well. Um, so to that end, we've um, got a role key provider and a role user key provider. So that role key provider is for mapping um, access to users with a particular role. And again, you can define that however you like. Um, that might be the SPSI Laravel permissions package or even just a column in your database. The role user key provider will map those role keys to individual users. So you can chain these key providers together to create any kind of granularity or level of, um, of access in your system. And this is the best approach if you need like hundreds or thousands of users to access an individual record. So um, we also create a middleware here um, and we add that um, obviously into the kernel 
And the purpose of this middleware is to decrypt the user's private key when they start their session. Um, and this middleware um, will manage access for the duration of the user's session um, and securely store it in the session cache. It also will clean up uh, once the session expires or invalidates. Now, you can also bypass this if you're um, using a different authentication mechanism and you can just provide a private key directly to the library. We've also um, need to add the key store, uh, has user key store trait to the user model and that's just to give it the relationships it needs to be able to access its related keys. Once we've, once we've got all that set up, we can um, create a, a model and encrypt some fields. So to do that, it's very simple. You just apply the model encryption trait and uh, implement, which that trait implements the encryptable interface. Um, and you can define uh, which encryptable fields are in there. So automatically the system will encrypt and decrypt those fields for you. Um, you also create the key providers array. And like I said before, you can have you can chain multiple key providers together. And this array will, in, in this example here, you can see that we've got the user key provider. So the user who creates that model will get access to it. If you add a role key provider, let's say you've got a staff um, role and you know support desk perhaps needs to access user records um, to help them when they phone up. So you can add all of those in here. The model uh, will behave pretty much exactly as a regular eloquent model. Everything works, including casts. Um, so if you need an encrypted date or anything like that, you're covered. Um, and the attributes are only decrypted on access. So if you're just loading that model and using a few unencrypted fields off it, there's no performance penalty or anything like that. Um, some exceptions to this, um, batch operations on these models are disabled, uh, and that's because they need extra care when they're dealing with um, assigning the appropriate encryption keys to individual users. Migrations, uh, if you're adding en encryption to an existing model, um, you can use this encrypted field type, and that basically just sets the right field size to cater for the ciphertext, which is typically a lot longer than the content. The biggest caveat with encrypting individual columns in your database is search. Um, <clears throat> searching and sorting isn't really possible in encrypted columns. So without uh, first decrypting the entire result set. And you know that can be slow and expensive, uh, and it's not really scalable. So to that end, um, we've also released a companion package which basically creates a blind index of the columns that you define in here. Um, the, you, you just have to add the ha um, has searchable hash trait and define those columns and then um, they're searchable with the search hashed field method. The caveat of blind indexing is that uh, you can leak potential information to a hacker. So let's say you're encrypting a last name field and you know, you've got a lot of Smiths in your database. All those um, hashes in the database are gonna be the same. So in a, you know, an attacker who has access to your database may be able to um, use say frequency analysis or something along those lines to determine what those likely values are. Um, or in an, in an active attack situation, um, a attacker might be able to sign in as a user in your system and they can perform their own search and find out what that hash value is going to be. Um, and then see, you know, they can create their own user, call them Smith or John or whatever, and see what all the other records in the database are. Uh, to reduce the risk of leakage like that, um, you can use um, concatenated columns. So for example, um, you might have, uh, again, that service desk example. You might need to look up your users. You could use last name and date of birth as a combined column 
concatenate those together, have a single hash for those, and you end up with less um, hash collisions there, or less, you know, more, more unique hashes, which leaks less data. So now we're winning. <laughs> we're achieving our goals. Um, you know, like we said, uh, the users can only access information that they should access, even if an attacker owns your server. They can only decrypt information for users that um, have actively made requests in the time that they've been watching the server. So this significantly mitigates um, your risk. You know, it, it means instead of an attacker getting access to your entire database, it only gets access to a smaller proportion. Um, and it significantly raises the bar for attackers to even get that far as well. So thanks for listening. <laughs> I hope the... Yeah, I hope the library is useful for the community and um, I hope it helps protect your, your users. And, you know, any feedback is welcome. Um, and also, you know, responsible disclosures are very well appreciated as well. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, very important question I saw here. Um, how do you justify straying from industry best practices and not using Alice and Bob in your cryptography examples? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I should use Alice and Bob. <laughs> um, Tim asks, does the library that you released offer affordances for rolling slash cycling encryption keys? Yes, it does. Yeah, it's got a built-in versioning system. So... Excellent. No, yeah, applaud that because that's hard, <laughs> hard stuff. Uh, when a new person, for example, a support desk person is onboarded, how do they get granted access to data that is already encrypted? Yeah, so that's a key uh, component of the key providers system in that you're creating an individual private key for a role, not for an individual user. So instead of having to go through and you know, decrypt and re-encrypt all the synchronous keys for every record you've ever created. You just have to do that one private key. Excellent. Last one. How do you cycle the app key without the app exploding? This person is too scared to touch it. Yep. <laughs> yep, that's a difficult thing to do. <laughs> uh, very good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Sounded like everyone enjoyed that one.